He used to say to me, don't let the bastards get you down. And it stuck with me. How do you stay so confident in your own skin? It's really hard to feel bad about a body you're taking care of. Make yourself bigger, make yourself stronger, make yourself healthier and happier. Don't kind of disappear. But you wanted like the original like pin-up girls. Like... Yeah, FHM, Maxim and Loaded in one month. Wow. I was on the cover of all yeah. three for one month. You're never going to please everyone, mm. so why try? It's like trying to do a maths equation that's got no answer to it. Does it make it easier having someone by your side? And how did you know, because I'm curious as well on this, how did you know he was the one? In that moment, everything like crumbled. There was nothing else in the world more painful. I go back to that moment and think you're a 17 year old little girl working in telly who lost the most important man of her life and you got through it. You will get through this. Okay. Welcome to my crib. Hi, I'm Gemma Atkinson and I'm on the Learning As You Go podcast. Hey! Wait, come on, some vibe, please. Hey, come on. Come on. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is a special moment. We yeah. have the incredible Gemma Atkinson live in the studio. This is something I've been trying to make happen for a while now. Um, the mega talented actress. Um, mummy influencer now, businesswoman. Yeah. Like, you just don't stop. I've known you for years. But yeah. when I looked at, like, into like, your career and what you've been doing, you just don't stop. You're 100 miles an hour. Yeah. Um, and you managed to, like, balance all of that whilst being a mum of two as well. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. When I think back, because I started out in the industry, I was 15 when I got Hollyoaks. Wow. And I'm 40 this year, so it's more than half You're my life. You're 40? You look amazing, by the way. Oh, it's because I've got my hair and makeup done. That is my, it's so but weird, yeah. because I met you, Gem, I think when you were about 16. So I've known you for years, and you yeah. have not changed over the years. You've always been just so grounded, humble, proper northern girl. But how have you stayed grounded? Like, because it must be really easy to lose yourself. I've seen it. We've all seen people in the industry yeah. who get carried away with themselves. But like I said, you've not changed. How have you managed to do that? I think it's just staying at home. Right. As in, I mean, everyone said to me at some point, if you want to be successful, you need to move to London. And I'd be like, why? I can get a train and get a train home. Mm. And I think the people who you surround yourself with, they're ultimately influenced by. And I was very wary of the people who were with me at the start had my best interests at heart. Mm. So even my agent, me and my agent have been together for like 20 odd years. What? Yeah. That's crazy. So I've kept everything kind of small and I've got loads of mates, you know, mm. based all over, but my core group of friends who knew me before all of this, we all live, literally I can walk to the houses. My sister's up the road, my mum's 10 minutes away. So it's kind of, I go and do all the work and the stuff and you have your odd weekend in London or whatever, mm. but then you come home and I think if you're surrounded by the right people, because they're not bothered that you've been on telly mm. or that you've presented whatever show, they're just like, okay, whatever, what do you want for your tea? Mm. So you don't get swept up in anything. Mm. And I also think it was easier for me back then because when you became in the public eye, it was social media yeah. frenzy. It was who's got the most followers, who's got the most likes. There was none of that when I was in telly. It was just a fun job. It was like uni, but you got paid. Do you know what I mean? There was Hollywood no... was the best as well. Hollywood yeah. was one of the best paid, wasn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, and do you know what? I'll tell you a story about that. You say it was the best paid. It was. And another reason about staying grounded. For a 15-year-old, I was earning a lot of money each mm. week. And my mum put it all in an account that I wasn't allowed to touch till I was no. 18. And every Thursday, she used to transfer me £250 to last me the week. I still do that now. What? Every Thursday... I transfer myself from my pot, £250, and that's for me petrol, for me shop. Gorka finds it hilarious, <laughs> genuinely. But he says to me, you have this and you have that, why? And I say, yeah, because I don't spend it, that's why. Do you no know what way. I mean? Not on stuff I don't need. Like I've never been into like, oh, let's get this bag because it's a designer. It never interested me. But things like properties and stuff like that. And it's because my mum drilled into me from an early age. Why do you need that? I said, oh, they pay me this amount. She's like, right, why do you need it? I'm going out the weekend. She's like, exactly. You don't need, you just, you're going to drink it up the wall. You're going to do this, you're going to do that. So she put it all in an account until I was 18. I didn't see it. That's incredible. So it sounds at the heart of everything, you've got a really strong core, whether it's your friends or your mum as well, who's obviously yeah. been a massive like um, influence on you. Because that's something I've noticed, because obviously I was a promoter for years. I mm. think it used to come down to my night sometimes. Yeah. And I had so many 
friends and everywhere mm. I went, I knew everybody. And I felt like that meant that I was kind of popular and, but in actual fact, now that, especially through going sober and turning my life around, now my yeah. circle is so small. Yeah. And I was saying the other day, like some of my best friends, the ones that you don't need to speak to all the time. No. But you can see, you, sometimes you go six months without speaking to them. But, but when you you're know, in the room. Yeah, when you're in the like room, it's away. exactly the same. There's no expectations. And it's just nice to know that you've got that where sometimes all the other noise is just, it's just noise. Yeah. But don't you find though now, because I was thinking about this when you asked me to come on here, I was thinking back, we've had some crazy nights, haven't yeah. we? Like messy. And you think, thank God there was no social media um, back then because mm. none of us would work again. Yeah. I always say this to everyone, all of my old mates. But you think back, and at the time, because I don't drink a lot now. Mm. I mean, my last, I've had one drink since October 2022. And it was wow. for my birthday, just gone. I was no pregnant way. for nine months, obviously. And then when Tiago came, I've had one drink since. So I've not really, I'm like you. But I don't regret any of that because when you look back, although it's not part of your life now, we had a good time. Oh, the best moments. We had fun. I belly laugh still yeah. at some of my... What do you even, think, when I get back to, When I meet up with my mates, all we talk about is the crazy times. And I, I sat yeah. down with, um, who was it recently? One of my therapists going, saying, um, I say one of my therapists, I've got two at the moment, which is mad. Um, just saying like, why is it that those are the times that still bring me joy? And I just hope that I can still have the same yeah. laughs in like being like sober because they are crazy no, stories to tell. you can. It's funny you're sober, I think, because you laugh at other people <laughs> and, you, and, you, and you get to have a laugh and you don't wake up with that. Who did I offend? Who did I kick off with? Who did you try and sleep with? Who do you? Yeah. All the fear. And you didn't do any of that, but mentally in your head, you did because it's bare fear and yeah. it's awful. So what was the moment for you where you kind of shifted that, that, that mindset from being, I don't know, the girl who's out in town to the girl who's like, because you were like, I think you were one of the first kind of actresses or like people in the industry to really kind of champion fitness, but in a different way where mm. you, even to this day, you still champion being strong and, and yeah. powerful, not just about being skinny and losing weight. You really went into the fitness route. Yeah. I think for me, obviously being on Hollyoaks, everyone was tiny. Yeah. And it, when I joined, I was at the puppy fat stage of, you know, I was 15. There was no consideration into how I felt, as in I could have a Chinese for tea one night and then McDonald's breakfast on the way into work. And then it'd get to like 11, 12 in the day and I'd be feeling so sluggish, such a headache, so tired. And because I was young, I didn't link it to, it's because you've just eaten a lot of shit for the last 12 oh. hours. I was just like, this is how it is. And it was only when, I, I can't remember who it was, I was... I thought the way to be healthy is to just run and cut out carbs because I was grew up in the era of Atkins. You have to do Atkins diet. No carbs before no Marbs. No carbs before Marbs. And you have to be <laughs> super fit, just run, run, run on the treadmill. And yeah, it made me lose weight, but I was so lethargic and just knackered all the time. And I read ages ago Sylvester Stallone's, one of his first books, and he was championing in women weightlifting, saying how it shapes your body. It gives you your curves. It gives you your muscle definition and it improves your health and I was thinking but everything I'd been thrust upon me in my time growing up it was you have to be a size zero cut out carbs do this because all the magazines back then were that mm. so I was reading his book thinking he's saying something completely different to these but he's made more sense to me as in how can you train if you're not fueled and rather than use diet and exercise it was fueling and training wow. and I thought that makes so much sense how can I Go to Rather the gym than if defueling. I, yeah, yeah, I thought it's like trying to drive from Manchester to London with no no petrol in your tank. Mm. You ain't gonna get there. So I started just taking little tips and eating a lot of food, but the right foods, foods that would fuel me and foods that would energize me, not foods that would make me feel crappy. And I noticed first of all my energy improved. I started feeling so much better. My skin got better. My sleep improved. And then the, the byproducts of that, the side effect was that was my body changed shape. And because that came second to how I felt, that's how I've been ever since. Wow. And it's just, I've always chased feeling good. Um, and I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not teetotal as in I'll never drink again. I, you know, I didn't drink over Christmas just because we were hosting. I had mm. the kids. And when I've got the kids in the house, I don't, you know, want to be drinking. But, but you know what it does to you. So you're not going to do yeah, it every day. It takes me now, like I drank on my birthday in Blackpool. In Stri we went to Blackpool with Strictly. And whereas back in the day, I could drink Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I drank on Saturday and it was Wednesday till I felt okay. Mm. And I was like, my body's just, it means because it's poison, isn't it? Mm. Ultimately, you're drinking out, it's just poisoning your body. Yeah, I think I think you're a bit like, like me as well, Jim. Like we value 
being productive. We value like working towards our goals and that just goes against everything. Yeah. Whereas back in the day, we might have valued just being sociable and everything else. So it was all, it was kind of in line yeah, with it. Yeah, priorities but, change. Yeah, but to lose five days now, it's just not, it's not even up for negotiation. And sorry, it's just not even up for negotiation for me. Like it's too important what I want to achieve. But it's funny you say about the morning after. I used to, I kind of think that feeling in a way helped me stop caring about the opinion of strangers because back in the day when we'd go out, again, there was no social. So you get photographers outside clubs, come down to this club, we'll picture you going in, free drinks for the night. You'd be like, mm. okay, you do it. But some of them were great and they'd just, you know, because there was no contrast. You just took their word for it. Mm. We'll only put picture you going in. Fine. The odd few would wait outside get you on the way out. and get you on the way out, drunk, Carnage. hanging, trying to get in a taxi, all the stuff you don't want people to see other than the group of friends who you're with. Mm. And if ever my agent rung me on a Sunday, I knew that's what it was about. And she sometimes would ring me on a Sunday, such a paper's running this story, they've got a picture of you, 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 you know, you, your strap's falling down on your top. You, you do look quite messy. The, you used to do it when you used to get, like, underneath, underneath you as well, didn't skirt, you? Like, yeah. I remember doing it to Tina. And, and they're running it saying you've done this, this and this. And I used to cry my eyes out and I'd be like, but it's not true, I didn't do that. That's not true. And they'd say, give us a quote or an interview and we wow, make it so go away. Basically blackmailed you. So it was like you'd panic so, so much. And I remember once being at my grandma's and she uh, was Scottish, my grandma, so I drink to them. She was like, whatever, it's fine. Mm. And they called, my agent called me and she said, there's a, a video of you and your mate um, ordering pizzas in a kebab shop. She's and apparently you're slumped on the, you know, the stand, whatever, waiting for your pizza, which is probably true. And I, I burst into tears and my grandma was like, what's happened? What's happened? And I said, oh, I went out with Laura last night and I got drunk and there's a video of me and I'm waiting for food. And, and she said, right, right. And she just looked at me and I went, oh, that, they're going to run it in the paper. And she said... Oh, she said, well, did you hurt anyone? Did you do anything wrong? And I went, no, but I'm drunk. And she just said, you're 22, Gemma. Normal life. She said, that's what people do your age. She said, these people don't know you, it don't matter. And to have my 80 odd year old grandma say that to me, I kind of went, oh my God, she's right. Every, so many people were in that shop with us. Mm. And from that moment, I thought, the amount of time I wasted on the opinion of strangers meaning something to me. And it was just like a light bulb moment that I thought those that I know and those that I care about know me. Strangers online, strangers out, people who buy a paper and read stuff, they'll read a headline and they can think what they want from it. I'm not bothered. I don't know them. Wow. Do you know what I mean? And but do you, do you it take, took that. Do you take that? And it's so interesting that because sometimes the fact that you just describe that then in a feeling, it's those moments in life that can massively just stay with you for the rest of your life yeah. and like change your perspective. Yeah. Um, and I was going to say, one of my questions was for you, Gemma, was like, you always seem to have been like really sure of who you are and not kind of followed the crowd. Like, mm. I, mean, I don't know if I was right or wrong in this, but I'm sure when in Hollyoaks, like you used to be get along with the lads a lot more than yeah, the girls. Didn't I still you? do. Yeah. You still do, don't you? <laughs> yeah. And you've always been proud of that. You've never been like shy yeah. to like, oh, do you know what? I'm, I just, I like being around the boys. and and. Yeah. It seems like you've been really clear on who you are. And like in this world now, like even your social media, some of your posts and stuff, it's just raw, it's unpolished. It's just yeah. like really like relatable. And that just seems to be an extension of who you are. Like how do you stay so confident in your own skin all these years? Because I always think you can't keep up a, a lie for too long. It's mm. like being in a relationship. If you're hiding who you really are from that person, within a few weeks, months, the mask's going to fall, mm. the charade's gone. And I think to do that for your life, just to please strangers, it's draining, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You'd be like, oh my God. And it's kind of, it's not the end of the world if someone unfollows me because I've not done a makeup tutorial mm -hmm. and they like makeup. They'll follow someone who does like makeup. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I follow people who are either my friends or who I find inspiring um, or anything to do with dogs. You know, I'll follow, I'll follow them. But I think because I've never took it, because I've never relied on it for my job, you know, I have a job. I work in the radio and I love it. And I get to have my social media page and jobs come in for it and brands and endorsements, which is great. But I've never kind of, it's not the be all and end all mm -hmm. type thing. Oh, that's interesting because you've actually, it sounds daft, you've actually had a career first and then the socials kind of supported it. Yeah. Where sometimes a lot of influencers are socials first and then 
They have a career off the back of it, yeah, which is fab for them. So for you, you're quite rare where sometimes a lot of like soap actors, you've got 1.9 million followers, right? Which is Mm. huge for someone like from the soap world originally. Yeah. So you've managed to do both, but I think that's really important what you just said then. Like you, and I had the same conversation with Jenny Powell. I said, do you ever feel like you have to keep up with the young ones and everything else? No, Scott, I'm just focused on being really good at my job. And if all this stuff comes off the back of it, that's yeah. fine, but she like treats her craft as a, does that make sense? Yeah, and I think because of social media, the younger generation now, they do view certain things. It's like everyone getting all this work done on the face and everyone wearing specific labels and mm. stuff. I'm forever telling to my niece and nephew, that ain't real, you know, and you're not going to be liked more in life because you know how to do a specific shape brow. Mm. You know, it's kind of, there was less pressure, I think, on us. I'd say always on on me. Mm. Um, So maybe that's why the whole not caring comes into it. Mm. But you say there's less pressure though. Let's go back to what you said before about, said you were in that puppy fat stage when you first started Hollyoaks and everything else. And like you were like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this or you want to be called but you wanted like the original like pinup girls. Like you were like, you was all over. Like was it FHM? Yeah, I I was the only uh, person. I'm going to slip this in. Here we go. I I knew she was going to say, your ranking. What was your ranking? No, I was the only girl I did. FHM, Maxim and Loaded in one month. Wow. I was on the cover of all yeah. three for one month. But no, I, I, that's the thing, I loved it. And and I'm, I've got every single magazine cut in, in my mum's loft. Really? Literally, like, piles and piles. I've kept them all. And I love the fact that I did it back when it was print. Because now everyone yeah. everyone's a model now on Instagram, aren't they? Yeah, yeah of it's course. It's so easy. But I think there was myself, there was Lucy Pinder... Danielle Lloyd. Oh, wow, Lucy Pinder. Michelle Marsh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. do you remember? Of course I do. Who's your Who's your Was it Hazel? Was it Hazel? Keely Hazel. Oh, God. That we, was were like, <laughs> we were like the OGs. Even Ethan's laughing at <laughs> We're going through the, and Kelly through the Brooke. archives. There was Kelly Brooke as yes. well. So we, I think, like, yeah, like us six, we had our own calendars and we had. And the you magazines know what, though, you and... were all different shapes and sizes exactly. back then. Exactly. You know, we talk about inclusivity, like yeah. now. In fact, back then, it's, you were all like natural beauties, if that makes sense. The thing is, though, what baffles me is they sold Kelly Brook as um, a curvaceous plus size. I've met Kelly. She is tiny. I she might. was, I met her, it was about 20 odd years ago. It must have been. No, it couldn't have been. It, I, was, I was doing Calendar Girl, so I was 26. And she was walking through London. And we stopped and had a chat. And she was tiny. And I was thinking to myself, as if all along you were pinned as the, the plus size. Wow. And there was nothing plus size about her. Mm. But then I thought, and that's the reason I spent hours on a treadmill not eating carbs because she was deemed big. Wow. And you think it's so stupid. But that's what I want to ask you then. So did you, at that point in your life, did you feel like you had to like cut down and trim down? Like, or, because you, you look back at that time then with a big, big smile on your face yeah, and you're really proud of, of what you achieved. But would you have done anything differently? Did you kind of pun- really punish yourself to look that way? Or did you just... No, no, I was just... I mean, I look back now and I think... I mean, someone um, messaged me on Instagram and said, what was your favourite shoot? And I did a calendar shoot in Thailand with brown hair. And I looked back at that and I was like, oh, this one. But I had no muscle definition, mm. nothing. I look back and I think, oh, my God, I look quite just plain. And, you know, just... you could. I, I could tell I wasn't training then. I wasn't looking after myself then. But that shoot in Thailand, we did like three days shooting and then we all flew to Bangkok and had four days in Bangkok. Mm. The photographer, all of us having a party. But that's what I mean. Your perception of looking good is completely different now to what it was back then. Like, And there's not many girls, I'll be honest with you, Gem, who would look at themselves and go, oh, I wish I had more muscle. The most girls I speak to... I need to look like a gladiator this year. That's my aim. Exactly right. And I love that. And I think that's kind of like the new era of like power women right yeah. but most of the young girls i speak to and everything else like they go oh no i wouldn't want yeah, any they muscles don't like it. Yeah. I, want, I don't i don't want any muscles i want to be really petite and everything else yeah. and what i love about you and especially what you do on socials you're saying you know what let's be powerful strong women and you, yeah. you're not only saying like it looks good you're also talking about like the positive the benefits as well the longevity of it. of it as well can you talk to me yeah. a little bit about that like what makes you want to yeah. look a certain way and it's, feel a certain way for me it's kind of i want to be a good example for my children mm. i never want mia to grow up thinking just to be a certain size i want her to be able to say you've got good legs go for a run 
you know, you, you're strong, you can do it yourself type thing. I saw you training with Ratchet. She loves it. In, in your she really gym loves at home. it. But I'm always mindful of her. Like when anyone meets to her, they meets her, they always go, Are you gonna be a dancer like your daddy? Are you gonna be able to dance like your daddy? And I'm thinking, her dad was like Spanish champion, he's one of the best, you know, dancers ever. Mm. And I and I always think she doesn't need that pressure because she's not really in she loves dancing in the house with him. But she started dance lessons recently and she said to me, I don't want to carry on, Mum, I'd like to do gymnastics. Mm. I was like, perfect, that's fine. And I always remind her, Mummy can't dance, Mummy's not a dancer, but I still did Strictly and I did okay. Mm. So if you're not good at it, it's all right as well. Mm. You can, you can, she can be like either one of us. I don't ever want her to think she has to be as good as her dad at dancing. Right. Um, and I, and I just wanted to know that regardless of her shape, I mean, they used to call me thunder thighs in school because I always had big legs. I used to do, um, I used to run athletics team for Manchester girls. I wish I got called thunder thighs. And, <laughs> and they, they used to Chicken call legs. me thunder thighs, yeah. Um, and in school, I'd be like, oh my God, I used to wear trousers in the winter. I used to cover them up in the winter. Um, but like just now I've come from a photo shoot and they just had me a shirt on with little shorts. And he went, are you all right in there? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Whereas I would have been, oh. So... I kind of, I don't want to get to, my, my, my granddad, God love him, he passed away when I was about 16 uh, and he'd had two strokes, he lost both of his legs, he lost wow. his speech. So he spent the last maybe two, three years just sat in a chair, non-verbal, just kind of. And then my stepdad, Peter, who's 73, he's obviously Mia's granddad in Tiago's, he plays football with her. He's on his hands and knees and she's using him as a horse. He's throwing her in the air. And he played football all his life. He stayed active. Mm. And it's people say, well, I'm going to live to 90 or whatever. But I always think I don't want to get to 90 and not be able to use like my body to function. Mm. And you never know, obviously, health-wise what's around the corner. But I, I always look at longevity and the functioning of my body. Like I want to be able to play with them for as long as I can. I want to be able to, you know, do the school run and be sprinting up and down with the like we do in the mornings and mm. and stuff. And I think for the younger generation now, we were so adamant on being tiny. I always think as you age, you, your body needs more weight on it. Your bones will thank you. If, if you strengthen your bones and your muscles now, and I always think as well, the older you get, we obviously we lose the elasticity in our face and our collagen. You'll look older. I think if you're starving yourself you're going to look older anyway. Mm. So it's kind of like, if you look at Salma Hayek and Jennifer Lopez, obviously they, they must have had a little bit of something and I tell mm. myself they have because otherwise they're just <laughs> goddesses. But they've got a, a bit of meat on them where mm. they look healthy. Mm. And I think for me, the women who are super, super tiny never look as naturally happy. Right. I always feel like maybe there's something... I don't know, something that's happened and they're starving themselves and they're trying to shrink themselves. And I'm all about make yourself bigger, make yourself stronger, make yourself healthier and happier. Don't kind of disappear type thing. Oh, I like that. What yeah. does a typical day in a life with you look like with your strength training? Like, what's your gym routine like? Um, I try and do upper body, lower, upper body, lower body split and then a cardio recovery day. So again, people will message and say, oh, I'd love to keep training, but my muscles are so sore. But if you split it up into body parts, mm. like one day you can do lower body, the day after do your upper body, and then the day after a cardio day, so a nice dog walk or some HIIT training, and then you go back to it again. And also rest, rest days are so important. People, You get some people say, oh, no days off. Mm. You know, I'm obsessed with Matt Wahlberg. I think he's gorgeous, but the whole no days off drives me insane because mm. you have to have days off. Mm. I think you have to, to mentally recharge, to physically recharge. Um, How many days off would you have? Normally me, I maybe train like five times a week. Yeah, so two days, same. Two days, yeah. And mm. even, you know, on holiday, I train every other day. Not because I think I have to, just because I love it. Especially mm. if, you know, you're in a hotel and you've got a good, an outdoor gym and the sun's shining on you. You think, mm. get my vitamin D and I'm training and I've got the pool after this and, you know, and I've got me all inclusive. You know, it's kind of, I soak it all up. Yeah. Um, well, what, I've, I've seen you, Gem, though, like doing um, bench presses, not bench presses, what am I talking about? The CrossFit stuff. The CrossFit stuff, like one second, I have my mind on blank. Deadlifts, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I've seen you doing like deadlifts and like big power moves, right? How would someone 
um, who wants to get started, like even begin to fathom how to do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, th I think it, if you go to a, a, a decent gym, you can approach anyone who works there and ask for help and they will help you. And there's nothing to be ashamed or embarrassed about. You know, women message me, I want to start in the gym, but I'm so overweight, I'm embarrassed to be even seen in there. And I always say, but the same way everyone goes to the hairdressers to have their hair done, everyone goes to the gym to better themselves. There's nothing wrong with anyone being in a gym because ultimately you're all there for the same reason, to move your body, to feel good about yourself. So what does it matter if you're larger or you're a novice? There was a time when I didn't have a clue how to even hold the dumbbells. I'd be like, oh my gosh, what are these things? But I asked someone who worked in the gym. I went up to a lady and I said, excuse me, is there anyone who can help me just with these dumbbells? She said, yeah, yeah, what do you need? And I said, I just, I want to lift them, but I'm worried about hurting myself and stuff. I've not never done this before. And she, she showed me. And then she said to me, you know, we do offer PTs. If you want one, you can. And I started with a PT just like once a week. And all you need is that one core session of learning your body, learning the posture, learning the movements. And, and people say, how many reps and what weight do I do? And I never go into detail with them because that could be someone who's five foot two, mm. who's never trained Specific before. For them. Yeah, they wouldn't lift the same as me. Mm. It's, it's like one of, one of my friends, Jamie, she's a CrossFit athlete. She is insane CrossFit athlete. I would love to train like she does. I can't do half the stuff she does. Mm. So I would never even try to. And unless I wanted to go down that road of CrossFit, I think I don't need to do mm. so many pull-ups in a session. I'm just not gonna do that. Instead, I'll do what I like, what I enjoy. And it's finding what you enjoy and not being, nothing upsets me more than when someone says to me, I feel too overweight to even go in the gym. Mm. Because it's almost like you want to take them in yourself. You want to say, I feel like replying, do you know what? I'm going to come to the gym with you and I'm going to show you what to do. Well, that's such a good uh, message. Some guy the other day in the gym asked me, like, you're a young lad, looked like you've been in and around the gym. And he said to me, I can't move that bench. And literally all they had to do was pop out the bench. It was dead simple. Yeah. And... I helped him do it and he went, and I, I thought, you know what? That was big of him to do that because yeah. not many people in the gym ask for help. No. And in actual fact, the people in the gym, like me, I felt like, I, I don't know why, but I just went into like nurture mode. Like I yeah. wanted to help him. And I think a lot of people have this perception that people in the gym are in their own lane and all that. If I've ever asked anybody for help in a gym, they are so like forthcoming. Yeah. Everybody wants to help. And I think really breaking down that stigma that no one wants to support you and that it's a really scary place. Like in actual fact, Anyone who's been on the wellness journey or looking after themselves, they really enjoy helping other people as well. Yeah. So I think being open to going into the gym and asking for help, you'd be so surprised how many people want to help you. So I just wanted to take a little moment before we crack on with the rest of the episode to let you know about something that I am super passionate about. If you followed me over the last few years, you know I've been on an incredible journey. I've managed to turn my lifestyle completely around and I've learned so much along the way. I've acquired various different tools. I've learned from so many different amazing people. And I've now managed to create my own wellness brand. I can't even believe it myself. Um, it's called Food for Thoughts, and we are now focusing on four key pillars. Nutrition, fitness, mindset, and connection. These are the four pillars that have got me to this point right now. We have just launched our brand new model in January, and it's gone off to a flyer. We've just signed loads of new members, and it's so beautiful to see everybody thriving at the start of this year trying something new, coming out of the comfort zone. And we've got a team of dedicated coaches and an amazing community that are going to help everybody get to where they need to get to. So if you're looking for a lifestyle change this year and you want to be surrounded by like-minded people on the same wave as you, and you want to have access to regular Zooms with specialist nutri coaches, Zooms with myself, guest speakers such as Ollie Ollerton, if you want to have regular fitness classes online and be part of amazing events on a monthly basis, then Food for Thoughts is for you. It's also for you if you feel like you're stuck in a rut, you're going around in circles, you feel unsupported and you want to make some changes, but you don't know where to turn. This is the perfect one-stop shop to get you started and moving in the right direction. And remember, if you want to make some positive changes in 2024, head over to www.f4t.com and take the first step in working towards your very own lifestyle change. Thank you for your patience and enjoy the rest of the episode. This is the thing that I wanted to ask you about like more than anything else, right? So obviously you see my socials, I'm talking about self-development, morning routines, obviously yeah. I've got food for thoughts and I'm, I'm preaching all the time about healthy routine and everything else, but 
I'm thinking, you know what? There's so many people listening to me going, it's all well and good, Scott, for you. You live on your own. You've got your dog. <laughs> yeah. I want to sit down with someone like yourself who's proper into the training, proper into the routine, but yeah. has a family and so much going on with work and everything else. And actually ask you genuinely, how do you build training and a healthy routine when you've got such a hectic life? Because I know I'm busy, but I'm busy in a different way. I'm mm. busy, like, obviously, I've got business stuff, but I don't have, like, two young babies, like, relying on me. Like, how yeah. do you make it work? Because I think a lot of mums will want to know that. It's just, yeah, annoyingly, it's about just making the time. I mean, people say to me, oh, it's easy for you because you've got, a, we, we're lucky we have a gym at home, but I still have to get, do the workout. It makes getting into the gym a hell of a lot easier. It saves me 25 minute commute, but. Up until three years ago, I was a member of a, a one of them 24-hour gyms. So sometimes I'd be there at half five in the morning. Sometimes I'd be there in the evening, whatever I could to get it in. Mm. Um, but you've still got to do it. And I think being a parent, obviously your kids are a priority. So there's some days where timing-wise it doesn't work for me. And I think, well, I can't, I can't control that. I can't control that Tiago didn't nap today, so I put it out of my way. But I can control what I choose to eat nutrition-wise. Mm. So the fact that I didn't get in the gym today is out of my control. The fact that I've not eaten three Mars bars today is in my control. So I focus on something else, which for me is nutrition, because even though you're not doing a gym workout, you can still feel good. Mm -hmm. I can still put the shower on cold in the morning and, you know, put it on my chest, get my receptors going and feel good about myself. I can still have a, a shot of coffee with some MCT powder in, looking at, you know, the daylight. There's still ways you can make yourself feel good. Even sitting cuddling your dog, there's nothing better to make you feel happy. Mm. So there is little things you can do, and it's, everyone seems to think you have to have a, a session in the gym yeah. to feel good. If you strip it back down, there's so many things you can do at home to make yourself feel mm. good. It's so interesting you say that, because you've just given me a little bit of a, an enlightenment moment then, because if I don't train sometimes, I'm like, right, well, I might as well, I might as well let loose a little bit on my diet, diet today. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because it's almost like everything has to be on point sometimes. Yeah. That's the way I've always lived. But yeah, all or nothing. Type where, yeah, all or nothing. Where that's such a good point of going, you know what? Just because you haven't trained doesn't mean it gives you an excuse to self-sabotage on your diet or anything no, like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's about little incremental wins in just different areas that will yeah. keep you moving forward. And I always think what all that's going to do is, I think to myself, well, I've, my body's had a rest today. I've still fueled it well. Tomorrow's going to be an even better session. Mm. You know, it's it's kind of, you're juggling and you sometimes a ball drops, but it's fine. You keep the others going. Oh, I like it. Um, rather than just like dropping than all throwing the balls. them all, yeah. Yeah. And one thing that changed my life, Gemma, and I know you're going to be a big advocate of this, is when I finally understood that I could eat pretty much what I wanted. I mean, we've got, yes. what, what have we got here? Banana. This is banana bread, yeah. We've got banana bread on the side here. And like, <laughs> In true kind of, I feel like once you unlock this knowledge, yeah, it changes you don't your whole life. Like, so basically, we were brought up in the same culture of like no carbs before Marbs, yeah. um, juice, diet. juicing diets, all the Atkins diets, keto yeah. diets, everything else. Oh. And they're all essentially the same thing. It's basically just putting you in a calorie deficit or it's just about understanding yeah. your calories and, and what's right for your body. And once I understood this in, I think it was 2020, and obviously that's how I launched Food for Thoughts because I was like, wait a second, this is like the key to life. Yeah. When you understand you it can changes have you. chips, bagels, chocolate, you pizza. Just need to, pizza, like you can have whatever you want as long as it's the right sort of calories for you and you understand your body, right? Yeah. It's a game changer. Yeah. And... It, you, it's scary to think how many people don't understand this. No. Like, what do you think is the fundamental problem with people around nutrition? I think it's a fear of, I mean, I'm always about count chemicals, not just calories. Ooh. Because like, you know, you could get a, I don't know, a protein bar and someone will go, oh, it's 99 calories. But the ingredients is about 12 different ingredients that you can't pronounce, words you can't pronounce. They'll get a whole avocado, it's 150 calories, I can't have that but it's a whole, it's a food. There's no chemicals in it. There's no shit in it that's going to ruin your body, ruin mm. your gut. There's nothing, it's a, and because they're so fixated on the calorie, mm. they'll go for the, the bar instead, which is just full of chemicals. So I think people are, are caught up on the culture of numbers, right. numbers on a scale, numbers on a packet. I mean, I, I'm always one of them. If I can't pronounce an ingredient, I think, ugh probably not best to be eating it, you know, mm. and there's so many hidden things. I mean, if you, it's things like sometimes if you go, I get um, chicken for the dogs sometimes and you'll look at the back and it's 
70% water. And you think, oh my God, or me, I love salmon. I picked up some salmon up the other day. It was farmed in Devon. So that, that fish hasn't even been in an ocean. Wow. And you're thinking, frigging hell, and that's what we're eating. Mm. So it's annoying because it's so much more expensive to eat good quality foods. And that's where everyone's failing at the minute because mm. unfortunately, cost of living crisis, you, you're doing what you can. Mm. And I, I always say to people, do what you can, do what is right for you and your family. But it's like my, I had to go on the scales for my UP stuff at the minute. Um, and I was 75, I think I was 75. And I said to Steve, oh, this is a benchmark. I'm going to be heavier in a, in a week or so because my period's due. Mm. But because I know my body, up to the build-up of my period, I can eat the week before. If I eat more carbs, it stops me going, like, mm. stops my men... Because obviously until you've had a period, you'll not know. <laughs> but any woman in here will tell you, it, it. you can literally go from wanting to strangle someone to crying your eyes out as if a dog's died in a movie to then thinking, I need I need to eat something, I need this, I need that. It's, it's horrible. Mm. Um, but certain foods and certain things you eat will trigger different hormone releases. Mm. And because I've understood my body, I know the week before I can stock up on my carbs and it keeps me keeps me level throughout my period week. Yeah, that's interesting. I think we talk a lot about food force, like 80% like whole foods, 20% soul foods. Like I yeah. think sometimes it's good to have, like I said, this weekend I, I, I've overindulged, I've had lots of treats, um, waffles, Pancakes, yeah, but you have to now and again. And that's fine. But then today I'll just reset a little bit and, yeah. and just get a bit more balance, get some more whole foods in as well. But I think like I've got to the point now where um, I'm intuitively eating now. So I, I kind of understand what like my calories are. It's not like I'm counting yeah. them because I don't think anyone should count them on a daily to day basis long term. But I think no. to get started, yeah, it's good definitely. to understand them. Because it's and like, if you've got a weight loss goal, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. I used to have salmon, avocado, uh, eggs in the morning thinking, yeah, I'm being really healthy and nutritious, which I am. Mm. But that's like... Some, um, if you didn't understand it, you, you wouldn't realize deficit, you're, only about, yeah. you're only about 800 calories in your morning before yeah. you even start your day. And if you're not exercising, exactly. It'll... And even hummus, like yeah. hummus and carrots, oh, it's dead healthy. Well, if you smash in a full tub of hummus, yeah, like no. it's just about understanding that some foods are amazing for you, but they might be a bit more calorie dense as well. And I think yeah. a lot of people don't understand that. But once you do understand it, it kind of really does set you free and it becomes second nature. And it just, I know you don't you're... have to cut anything out no. either. That's why. I always do the same as you, 80% what my body needs and 20% what I want. Like every every weekend, especially when Strictly's on, me and Mia, we put the DV on the couch, we'll have a pizza. We have Maltesers and she, has, she calls it a sweetie pizza and it's like a little Haribo pizza. Oh. And we get one of them each every Saturday without fail. And then throughout the week, she'll have vegetables with a tea, a snacks at school. She normally has cucumber and a little mm. naked bar. So she'll eat good food. Yeah. But then at the weekend, we're like, yeah, you, you want to have you know, Nutella for breakfast, go for it, kiddo. It's yeah, a Saturday. Yeah. Nice. Do you know what I mean? I'm never going to say to her, do not eat that or do not eat this. It's kind of, well, you, you can eat that, but not today because you're going to school yeah. and I don't want you falling asleep in class. Right. At a weekend, you can eat that because if you feel tired and sluggish after it, you're on the couch, oh, it's such fine. A, that's such a good, important message to share with kids at an early age because I never thought about that. If someone says you can't eat that, they won't say why. Yeah. So it's like the you don't want to say because it's a bad food because there's no good or bad food. Then you demonise it. Yeah. But the fact you're saying you, you won't have enough energy. Yeah. You're like, oh right, so I need that. For it took yeah. me until getting into like my my late twenties, early thirties to understand that full. Uh, so food was fuel. Yeah. And food is energy, like you said, and it's such a new way of looking at it. Whereas a lot of people, they look at like food sometimes as it's just like. They don't understand that it's the key to everything. Yeah. In terms of your productivity, your sleep, your energy levels, just yeah. everything. And I think some, sometimes we kind of undervalue the importance it plays in our lives. It's, I mean, the thing with a parent, with parenting, I was one of those, when I was pregnant with Mia, I was like, she's not having chocolate. I'm not going to give her McDonald's. She's not having any of that. And I think it was, I don't know, as soon as, must have been about six months in, she was screaming in the back of the car and I was driving, like shoving chocolate buttons down. I think you're having whatever. Um, and sometimes it, you think it's easy to cave in and just say, right here, have it. But we've tried to stay strong in that because we know it will benefit her in the long run. And it's things like, I mean, she's not got her iPad or anything yet. She's not got a screen. And some people have said it, she's missing out on so much because they can you can learn on them. And But I just know probably next year when she's in year one, she'll have to have one for school. So if I can just keep her that little bit longer mm. until she's like this, you know what I mean? And it's a blue light as well. You know, it's kind mm. of, I want to get a screen protector and all this stuff. And it's, 
Yeah, it's it's tough because you do do what's easiest as a parent because you have to. That's what I was going to ask you about. As a parent, and this is something that I've been reading about recently, sometimes it's easy to be good cop. And you basically yeah. parents want to be loved, they want to be liked. Yeah. So it's easy to kind of give in. But then I realise now that sometimes it's it's the tough parenting that is the most like effective. Yeah. Um, which is difficult to do. And I never really looked at it like growing up, like sometimes the kids who had the strictest dad or the mum, like they're probably the ones yeah. who come out the most grounded yeah. and more stable because they've learned the kind of the hard way. You learn the value. It's like my mum giving me only £250 a week when Pollyots were paying yeah. thousands. I was like, you can't do this. I hate you. Now it's the best thing she ever did. Yeah. Literally the best thing she ever did. It's taught me the, the value of things. It's taught me to be sensible with things and... Yeah, I mean, it, it, me and Gorka are very different in that aspect, whereby he's he tends to be more, because he's away a lot with Strictly, so when he comes back, he doesn't want to be telling her no. Mm. He's like, I'm only with her for two days this week. I'm going to do everything mm. with her. And I'm like, oh, okay, but she has got school in the morning, so she needs to be asleep for 8 o'clock latest. Mm. Is that okay? And then I'm sat there, 20 past 8 downstairs, and I can hear running around. I go up and there's a den made, and he's like throwing her around. And I'm thinking, come on. Because then when he leaves the next day... You've got to rebuild that I'm routine. And then waking her up for school, and she's grumpy. Yeah, yeah. So, I th yeah, it's, we're, we're a bit of both. I, my mum was always firm but fair with me. And I kind of... She was a more strict... You'll probably relate to it. Maybe not, because Ryan was probably good, but my sister was a bit of a rebel. She was seven years older than and me. Ryan was a rebel. And she went through a stage of just being awful to me mum and stepdad. Um, she was like, she'd say she'd be back at 10. She won't come back until like after midnight, worrying them and, you know, parties when mm. they weren't in. So my mum was more strict with me because she didn't want me being the same. And I used to say, hang on, I've not done that yet. You're punishing me for what our kid's done. Mm. And she'd say, end of story, like it, a lump it. So I don't know if maybe you got that. I'm probably Adam. Mm. You know what I mean? Because... Because Ryan was a terror. Yeah. Uh, no, I get that. I think what I've noticed as well, because obviously with nephew and nieces, sometimes because I don't see them as much as I'd like to, when it's the birthdays or Christmas, like I'm you almost overcompensating by like spending and doing this thing. And my brother's like, Scott, like, you need to chill that like, you're not teaching them the right way. Like, yeah. just giving them, and also they get whatever they want. Can you imagine you've got me coming in yeah. and you've got Adam and like, we all want to spoil them. And it's like, in a way it could be kind of, it could be detrimental to, to them like growing up because they don't really learn the value of stuff as well. So it's kind of like having to pull pull yeah. back and get that balance right, which is difficult because when you love them so much, you want to yeah. go above and beyond. But You find yourself saying, do you think we've got a money tree in the back garden? Uh, yeah. Or ice cream, man, get a chalk ice. It's mad. <laughs> you find yourself saying things your mum used to say. Oh, my God. But you have to because it will benefit them later on. Mm. What would you say then over the years? Like, obviously, you've been in the industry, you've seen it change so much, and you've seen social media come around. Like, what has been like your biggest lesson from it all? And I think we've touched on one of them before, which was obviously just not caring what other people think, yeah. which is really interesting because you say now that you don't rely on other people's opinions and what they think, but really though, to to be kind of to to be here now and like to be in the limelight sustainably yeah. and obviously be on radio and stuff like that, you do kind of need people to like you. Yeah. Do you but not to, everyone will though. Not everyone will. So it's almost like just, I, I like what you said before about having your kind of niche and owning that. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. I always just think you're never going to please everyone. Mm. So why try? It's like trying to do a maths equation that's got no answer to it. You just mm. drive yourself crazy. Mm. And I, 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 ju I just think if you're normal and authentic and true to yourself, you'll attract the right people. And mm. ultimately, that's who you want around you anyway. Mm. You know, you don't have to be nasty to anyone. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm cutting them off, whatever. It's just like, you do whatever you want to do to make you happy. And, you mm. know, if it's going out and, and dancing on tables and drinking or doing tutorials or doing glamour modelling or whatever, amazing. I champion whatever anyone wants to do, mm. but I'm going to do what I want to do as well. Mm. And your circle will get smaller, because it does, even more so. But then on the, on the flip side, your following can get even bigger because I think that's a credit to why you're so kind of followed and admired because you are just unapologetically yourself. And I think sometimes with me, it's like, what you see on social media with me is me, but it's kind of sometimes an amplified version of me. Yeah. Does that make sense? And yeah. I try to show the low days because I'm not always super positive. I'm no. not like, my team will know that. I don't think that. anyone is. Do you know no. what I mean? And I try to show those, those down days, but also it's not necessarily what people 
look for you, look to you for when they follow yeah. your pages. They want that kind of inspiration and stuff as well. And I think for me, the best influencers are the ones that just kind of raw like yourself and people like Olivia Atwood who just like, you can tell she just don't care what yeah. she says and what she no. does. And people just buy into that. Yeah. And I think it's difficult to kind of let your guard down sometimes because especially for someone like yourself, like I know yeah. Ryan, for example, and even people like Brooke Vincent, like they're so used to being like protected by the character. Or, yeah. Like and also Jason the, Grimshaw. And also the old school <laughs> way of media uh, being media trained was like don't don't let people in. Don't let yeah. them know anything. We used Whereas to have to have a checklist of what you can and can't say. Exactly. Now it's like the more open you are, the more yeah. raw you are, the more people are going to engage with you. Yeah. Does that make sense? I always think if I was I always think I'd like to come across as someone's mate, as in I would never, ever want anyone to feel e either threatened or insecure or sad or anything around you. You want people to feel good around mm. you. And, you know, and, and just kind of, yeah, I'm extremely lucky. I've worked in TV and media my whole life, and it's wonderful. But it doesn't make you any better or any worse than anyone else. Mm. It, that's just the career path that you've got, mm. you know, and I think... There's so many amazing people and amazing careers and the more you can get from people and sit and, and learn about them, mm. like, it's just, it's wonderful. I did um, a, a trek, a copper field trek a few years back and I had to be team captain of like 20-odd women. You've done so much for charity as well, aren't you? Especially yeah. breast cancer. Well, that's what it was and there was 20-odd of us and I was a little bit nervous because I was like, 20-odd women, you know what I'm like, it would be easy if it was 20-odd guys because <laughs> I could just be like one of them. <laughs> And we're still on, we've had two reunions, we're still on a WhatsApp group, we're still all so close. The, the stories I've learnt from them, and one of them's a GP, one of them's a receptionist, they're all different. And it's kind of, when you're around people who aren't necessarily in your industry, you learn so much. Mm. And it's so in incredible, the more you can absorb from different people in different walks of life. And you wouldn't want to shut any of that off just because you're on telly. Mm. And just because you're in media. Do you know what I mean? It's that's stupid. Yeah, I get that. You're gonna embrace it more. Gemma Atkinson in the limelight to Gemma at home. Do you have quite quite clear boundaries? Or do you are there, are there some days when you just like you find yourself like on social media, probably posting too much or anything like that? Do you ever get to that point? Because sometimes I'm like, I'm always got two lives living at the same time. Yeah. Because like I'm so invested, and this might be something you go, chill out, Scott. I'm not even on the same wave. But I think if you are an influencer or you are on social and stuff, sometimes you feel like you've got you're obliged to kind of give your followers an insight into your life and stuff like yeah. that. And I sometimes find it difficult to draw the lines between what what's my time and what I should share with everybody else. I I used to be like that. I mean, obviously I do some of my jobs are online and you'll have a contract. It's all done mm. and you have to post on a specific time and a specific day because the brand that's paying you mm. wants that time. Mm. And you agree to it. But if something comes up, I'll have to I'll just message my agent and say, "Look, I, I've got no signal, I'm at such a place. It's mm. really important. I can't do it that day. You don't want to let employees think you're not good to work with, mm. so you honour it. But again, people who follow me will sometimes be like, oh, not another post for them. But mm. they're, you know, it's, it's your job. You're doing a job for mm. an employee who's paying you. Mm. Don't let that person get in the way of that. Mm. It's, you know, you've got to just remember what it is you're doing and why you're doing it. And do you, I can't. This is. I, I can't imagine you being affected by this. If a post doesn't do well, does it bother you? Say if you post and it mm. doesn't do well as like your other post, would that no. affect your mood? No mood. Yeah. Does it bother your mood? No. I see. I can no. imagine like it doesn't. No, because sometimes you, you put it. I put it up for a job I'm doing, and then it'll be like eight hours later. I'll go. Oh my god, I've not replied to these, and I have to go back on it. Yeah, and, yeah. and go through because I'm just busy. You, you know, you're but doing things. This is things. what I'm saying, mate. Right? It's almost with you, Gem. The less you want it, the more you get it. In, in this industry, like, because you're not so focused on, like, chasing numbers, chasing um, the limelight and everything else, you're just doing your career and this is just a bit of a byproduct of what's happening. Yeah. That seems to be why it kind you of just flows. just roll with it. Yeah, it's roll, you roll with it, you're not putting pressure on it. And I can tell, like, when I look at your Instagram and stuff, I can just tell, like, Gem just, like, I can't imagine going, oh, I need to post this at this time no. to get this engagement because this is, do you I know what I mean? Got, I ain't got the time. Are you quite laid back, though? Like, because you yeah. are, like like I said, you're releasing children's books, you're doing a radio, you've done theatre, you've done so many different shows, like... Mm. My mum I, says I'm horizontal and it drives her mad. But how can you be that laid back? Because you, you're so career-driven. Like, you, you know make your stuff happen all the time. My dad passed away when I was 17, and he used to say to me, don't let the bastards get you down. 
and it stuck with me. And I always think with, with work, with relationships, with situations, with social media followers, me, when my dad passed, it was the most horrendous time in my life. It was, I couldn't think of any, like a worse pain that you've been through. Mm. And I always think if I've lost that, that core matriarch, the most important person in my life and coped, I can cope with losing a few Instagram followers. Mm. I can cope with losing that job that wasn't for me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I can cope with losing that boyfriend who wasn't right for me. Because you, you, you go back to the worst trauma that you've ever experienced. And if you're still standing at the end of it, you still got through it, then everything else is insignificant in comparison. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And I always go back to that time of 17, getting a phone call off my mum, your dad's had a heart attack at work, he's died. I was like, what? I remember I just passed my driving test and I was like, what do you mean? And I, th I thought she was joking. And that moment, everything like crumbled. There was nothing else in the world more painful. And it took a good, I'd say a good eight, nine years for me to navigate through that. Mm. Like, it, it, I remember when I finally deleted his number from my phone, it was, awful and I remember I deleted his contact months and months after and I just felt empty and I was like I shouldn't have deleted it you know little things mm. but I think if I'm ever struggling with anything in my life or I'm kind of at a crossroads or I'm feeling a bit I go back to that moment and think you're a 17 year old little girl working in telly who lost the most important man of her life and you got through it you will get through this whatever it is and it does always get me through wow. little things Oh, that, that's mad because, first of all, sorry, because I, I never knew that. Oh, did you not? No, no. I didn't know that. And um, I think it's difficult, though, sometimes to keep that perspective. Yeah, it is. And, and fair play that if you can, but I was about to say to you, like, what does get you down? Like, like, is there anything that does get you down on a day-to-day -day basis or something that, like, where... where you get... Do you ever get stressed? That's what I'm interested in. That, what stresses you out? Um... Yeah, I mean, I, I will get stressed at times. I know stress is bad for me health, though. It's good. It's bad for it. Makes you age, and I can't age any quicker. I'm wow. like, no. <laughs> so I just kind of just have a bit of zen. Okay, so let's give, give me your tips then. If you do get stressed, what are your tips to deal with it? Like, well, you, you kind of think to yourself, is this going to matter in a few? Is, is this going to matter in an hour or so? Like, I'm stuck in traffic. Oh my god, I'm late for the shoot. Oh my god, they're going to think, is it going to matter when you get there? No. Okay, so just breathe. And it's the whole thing again. Growing up, my mum was always my mum always told me there's someone far worse off, Gemma. Like when I used to say to her, oh, "I'm starving," she used to say, "You're not starving. You're hungry." There's children starving in different countries, Gemma. They've got nothing. They've got nothing on the plate. Are you really starving? And I go, "No, I'm just hungry." <laughs> and she'd be like, "Well, there you go." And it's that whole kind of there's always someone worse off than Ooh. you. You know, I'm, I'm moaning about being stuck in traffic. There's there's someone who's having to walk to work, not got a car. They're moaning, you know, about I'm having to walk to work. There's someone in a wheelchair who would love to walk to work. There's always a domino effect that way and that way. So you stay in the kind of middle of it and you just appreciate everything a bit more. But it's mm -hmm. tough. I mean, I'm 40 this year and it's only the last, I'd say, four or five years that I've got to that place. Mm -hmm. So I think it is something as you get older as well, you just kind of don't sweat the small stuff as much. Whereas when you're younger, something so insignificant, like, oh my God, my outfit doesn't match. It's like before a night out, you'd be like, I'm not going. There's no way. <laughs> or like you, such a body said they'd come to my opening. They're not coming. Yeah. Wheels have fallen off. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You'll, you'll have another one next week. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my business coach, I go in there and he just, and um, sometimes I'm ranting and raving, he's just like, Scott, this is just all part of it. Just got to enjoy it. Like, and it's perspective. I think that's the biggest lesson I've just took from this podcast is yeah. perspective. You've got to look it, after your heart. Stress makes it too, 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 too. Yeah, it's not it's, good. It seems like you've got real good perspective. And I had it once when I went to India with, with the bros and did that show over there. Yes. And we saw all these kids in the slums all oh, so it's happy. Awful. With nothing though, yeah. but they're so happy. And I just felt like, oh, I don't want to lose this perspective. You, but you come back and you get back into yeah. the, the kind of rat race and lose it all. But I think you're right though, as you get, as you get older, and that's why I'm so like kind of um, inquisitive on how you manage to stay so horizontal as you call it, because mm -hmm. I think it's a really nice place to be. Maybe it's with being with a Spaniard as well, because he's all manana, manana. He'll do everything tomorrow. Espanol. Oh, talk to me about Gorka everything then. Everything I so ask what, him what, to do tomorrow. Does it, does it make it easier having someone by his side? And how did you know 
because I'm curious as well on this. How did you know he was the one? Do you know what? When I did Strictly, Gorka had only been over in the UK for a year because he joined Strictly in 2016 and I joined in 2017. And it's going to sound really like big-headed and arsey and I don't mean it to, but he's the only person who I was dating and went on to be in a relationship with who didn't know anything about what I'd done who I dated, mm. what I'd worked in. He he now, when the celebs announce for Strictly, he has to Google them or ask me who they are and what they've done. Like mm. when Adam was announced, I was like, oh, you'll love him. You'll you'll really like him. How do you know him? I used to go out with his brother. <laughs> oh, he was like, okay. <laughs> and he loves Rye as well. Yeah, yeah. But so there was no, he he didn't have any expectations so he, he of me. he loved you for you or liked you just for you yeah, at that time. Yeah, when, when we met... I mean, he, he, he Googled me like he Googled everyone else and he'd seen my pictures and stuff, but he didn't have a clue about any TV shows or he, he didn't know anything. Mm. So and I didn't ever feel like I had to explain anything to him. It was, it was just brand new for both of us, which was lovely. I guess it's like if you moved to a different country and you started dating someone who was in the public eye, but you only met them that day, you wouldn't know why they were in the public mm. eye. So you'd be like, so tell me about what have you done then, tell me. Mm. And it was the same for me. In Spain, he's well known for his dancing, you know, and he's a, he's a judge on the Spanish version over there and people know him. I didn't have a clue. For me, he was just a professional dancer on Strictly who we, we got to know each other. And all your life, because I know I would have been the same, if I was going out with you, I'd be like, I'm going out with Joe Atkinson. <laughs> like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Because you must have always had that all your life. So for, for not to have that and just be... In a relationship where you just feel like someone's in it just for you yeah. and nothing else, but that's it, a nice feeling. I think when you can be unapologetic yourself and, like I said, there's no masks, there's no kind of insecurities or anything else, I think that's when... You when find you, your true happiness. Because yeah. I went through a phase of going out with people who were in similar industries, mm. who were in the public eye because I felt safer with them because yeah. I went out with one guy oh, years ago who I'd met on holiday and he's the only person who sold a story on me. And it was vile, all untrue what he said. But he had everything to gain from selling a story. He got paid. He was like, yeah, I've done whatever. And I had everything to lose because I was in a job at the time, you know, wh wh whereby it didn't look great what he was saying. And I remember saying to my mates, but if I go out with someone who's also an actor, who is also in the public eye, they don't, they, even if we split up, they won't sell a story on me because they won't want stuff coming out either, mm. because they won't want their reputation damaged. Mm. And that was why I, I went out with people who were in the same industry, because I, I felt safe for if it went wrong, that they wouldn't try and throw me yeah, under the course, bus. Of course, it makes so much sense. They, a they, lot of people do that in yeah, the industry. They, they won't try and throw me under the bus. They'll understand how it works. You know, they'll they'll know if a, if a journalist rings them up, they, they'll say, I ain't commenting, bye. They won't be tempted by, oh, we'll give you 10 grand if you tell us mm. what you did in the bedroom. They'll be like, absolutely not. I'm and embarrassed. Gorka's kind of the best of both worlds because obviously he is, kind of, he understands the industry. Yeah. Like I said, because he was foreign, he wasn't kind of like prejudging you or... No. Like, yeah, he wasn't getting wrapped up in the whole backstory of Gemma because he was just there for you, which yeah. was a nice feeling. I'm just interested because it, it sounds like you had to kiss a few frogs yeah. to find your like Prince Charming. And I can, I can see, like, I don't even like study you guys on a day-to-day -day -day basis, but when I do look at your soldier, I can see it just works. Yeah. You're kind of in tune with each other. Because he's very chilled as well. Like every year we Strictly, every, there's always every single journalist, do you worry about the Strictly curse? Do you worry about his partners? And I knew Helen Skelton in advance. I followed her on Instagram. There was an article I was following her to spy on him. The partner after Nikita, I'd never met her. So I didn't follow her because I didn't want her to think, yeah, you've got my part, you've got my boyfriend, I'm following you. Mm. I didn't follow her because I thought I'll need to meet her. They did an article saying we'd had a massive feud. So I thought, well, I'm not going to win here. And he's mm. forever saying to me, will you come and watch in the studio, please? He's like, everyone has their partners there. You're never there. And I said to him, Gorka, the last thing, because I've been a contestant, I said, the last thing your dance partner needs is me on the front row like this every week. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I said, they have to enjoy it and they have to feel relaxed with you. Mm. And in order to feel relaxed, they, they need to just, just have your time dancing. Yeah. Give them the, like, the best experience ever. And then at the end, at the rap party, you've, well, of course we'll all be together. And people, it goes from either I don't care or I'm worried about a curse. And the, 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 the truth is, win. I just want them to enjoy yeah. it with him. 
Mm. And I'm not going to be like, again, it must be with the chore thing. I've never been bothered about the thought of someone cheating on me. Really? With anyone? No, I've I've had I've had, I've had relationships where I've thought, oh, they probably would, they probably will, mm. but until it's happened, I've not That's good. beat myself up not over to it. it. Yeah, you don't seem like an overthinker. No, I don't think I'm clever enough to be an <laughs> overthinker. <laughs> when I said it, I, I didn't mean that you're, you're pretty stupid. <laughs> no, but it's like to worry about something that's not even happened. Yeah, is silly. You are very much like our Adam, but to yeah. be fair, our Adam stresses about a lot of stuff. To be fair, but yeah, you just seem to you seem to live quite in the present. Yeah which is cool. And I think yeah. that's rare as well. Listen, Gem, I could sit here and talk to you all day about this. Like, this is next level, but we are in January. Yeah. Um, and we both like to inspire people. So yeah. if someone's listening to this podcast right now, what would what would be the three things, yeah, mm -hmm. that you would advise to focus on in January if you're going to work towards a goal or you want to feel good about yourself? What three things would you prioritise? Like, for me, one thing at the moment that I've been, like, focusing on is sleep. Yeah. Like sleep has been a game changer for me. I've got this new aura ring, which measures my sleep and everything else. That's not a plug, by the way. Just I'm obsessed. I haven't had a full night's sleep for four years. <laughs> exactly. But this, this is why I wanted to ask as well, because yeah. obviously it's easy for me to say that. But like, let's say, for example, because obviously I have a lot of women who watch this podcast yeah. uh, and listen to it. What advice would you give to someone who wants to get started, but they've got, they're a busy mum. They've got so much going on. They're busy with work. Like how did yeah. he get started? I always think, again, strip it back. If you think you can't do something, having a baby is the biggest workout of your life. They've already done that. Yeah. They've got through it. Um, I would make small changes, not put too much pressure on yourself. Mm. Even if it's just, I'm going to drink two litres of water a day. Yeah. That's good. Hydration is key to so many things. If you can keep hydrated, you're already winning the day. That's my water. I yeah. Speak, I've not touched mine, yeah. but I have got a two litre bottle over mm. there. Um and yeah, and just just small small changes make a massive difference. Using the stairs instead of the lift at work, dedicating Swap, swapping your Haribo for your bottle of water. Yeah, read that you did yeah. that as well because you used to pick up the Haribo to, at the petrol station. When I was station. paying at the petrol station, yeah. and just dedicating. I mean, I do a stretch app eight minutes a night. I do. You can either do eight fifteen or twenty two minutes on this app. I do eight minutes a night. That's it. Really? Before bed? Before bed, yeah. Won't it be after, like when you wake up in the morning? No, I do it at the end of the day because I'm you're more warmed up because you've been doing daily things, nice. haven't you? Do it first thing in the morning, you're a bit creaky, but if you do it at night, you wake up feeling yeah. good. And cold water therapy, I think, is great. If you can turn your shower to freezing cold, um, or if you've got an ice bath, anything like that. It doesn't that. have to be extravagant, massive changes. Just good hydration, cold water on your chest and your neck in the morning. Try and work your way up to three minutes if possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that yeah. though. It's just the incremental little changes day by day that build a lifestyle. And I think that's something I realised. You don't have to be smashing Barry's boot camp five times no. a week and eating brown rice. No one's rice got time for that, no. And, and dry chicken to get in great shape. It's just little changes that you actually enjoy. Yeah. And I've got a, a woman sat in front of me today in great shape who clearly doesn't... She's got I'm going to smash that She's when got we finish. Banana bread in front of me. <laughs> and you're not stressed and you're not thinking, whoa, I can't eat this, I can't eat that. And I think that's the key to life when you get to that point. So um, if you are listening, there is another way. Absolutely. Yeah. And give Gemma a follow. <laughs> and oh, give Scott a follow. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gemma. <laughs> Thank you, Honestly, for having me. That was amazing. Oh, Thank it's you so been much. lovely. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. I've known Gemma for so long now. And one thing that I forgot about is just how chilled and laid back she is. And it's kind of infectious because for someone like me, who's fast paced all the time and stressing, Gemma seems to be so busy, but she seems to take it all in a stride. And she's not an overthinker. She seems to take every day as it comes. And there's a lot to be said for that. And today I really took a massive lesson from her. And that was perspective. She never seems to let anything drag her down or stress her out. And I think it goes back to that moment with her dad when she basically shared how Losing her dad was one of the worst moments of her life. And if she can deal with that, she can now deal with anything. And I think that's true. I think sometimes in day-to-day -day lives, we let the littlest things stress us out and the things that we can't control. Whereas, as Gemma said, look at the things you can control, do something about them, but let everything else go. And Gemma is just so relatable, warm, friendly, proper Northern. And I took so much from sitting down with her. So I hope you do too. Another great episode of Learning As I Go. So make sure you rate, 
you subscribe and you listen wherever you listen to your podcast and please tag me on Instagram with all your stories and takeaways scott.thomas I love to see them and it really does make me happy so thank you again and I will see you next week for another episode and life lesson with learning as I go Thank you.